our values drive us. We fundamentally yeah. care about people. Um, it's not about becoming a millionaire or running a multi-million pound business. Uh, they are faster and easier ways to become rich than running a Afro hair product business. Uh, we just care. We want to change the world for the people with Afro hair. We just believe that there's a lot of work to be done. Hey guys. Hey. Welcome back to another episode of the Business Success Stories, where we put the spotlight on inspiring business stories by every everyday people. I'm Mary. And I'm Ken of the Humble Penny and Financial Joy Academy. And what we do on this channel, guys, is give you the tips, the insights, and practical hacks to help you work towards a dream life of financial independence and money joy. Guys, we are super excited today because we have two very special guests. Mm -hmm. We have Joyce Lynn and Rachel from Afrocentrics, and we're super, super excited to be interviewing them. Hey, ladies. Hey. 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 Thanks for having <laughs> So tell us ladies, what is your business and what inspired you to get started? Sure. So the business is called Afrocentrics and we formulate, manufacture and sell natural hair care products for Afro and curly hair. We kind of fell into the business. It wasn't something we planned to do. It was mm -hmm. out of the need. Um, so the business was set up over 10 years ago and our issue was we couldn't find anything that worked on Afro hair, but that didn't contain toxic ingredients and the stuff that was on the market back then, uh, you'd have to ship it from America and then the shipping okay. fees and customs would be more than the actual product. Wow. Um, there just wasn't very much access to good products for Afro hair. Um, I had, was looking for stuff for my hair, came mm -hmm. up with a hair oil that I just used at uni. Nothing special at the time. I thought I gave extra to Rachel, used it on her skin. She was like, this is great, we should start a business. And I was like, I didn't really come to you need to start a business. And she was like, then she said, I did it with you and we did. And she hit the library, we hit the library, we got together. It was really Rachel's ideal, making it into a business. So the products here, the reason that we started, as Joyson said, was to solve our own problem. And the reason I got so excited when Joyson gave me some of this oil she made for her hair is that I've got really bad eczema and I'm allergic to everything. Yeah. In fact, Joyce and my other friends, Ian, used to joke that I should live in a bubble because, <laughs> you know, the allergies were, yeah. were constant. Yeah. So all of our products, we've designed them with ingredients that are hypoallergenic mm -hmm. just to begin with before you even begin to blend them. Yeah. And we've okay. made them so that the whole family can use them. Okay. So we use, uh, you know, organic fair trade shea butter from wow. our cooperative in Ghana. Mm -hmm. We use the top quality raw materials for every single ingredient so whether that's our coconut extract or aloe vera mm -hmm. we're always looking for the best possible natural products mm -hmm. that have proven clinical claims so we want things that really impart moisture to the hair mm -hmm. we want things that will you know smooth down the cuticle to make the hair look great mm -hmm. but also things that aren't going to react with your scalp or your skin or your hands as you apply the products well i was just going to say that when we got here this this afternoon, it was just great to actually see your team, see everything. Yes. So this office is as well as your factory as well. So Rachel and I actually formulated the first five products in the range. Well, actually six. Yeah. Um, we did the <laughs> ones that are out as well. It's been us. <laughs> yeah. So we formulated them, and we've only just really been able to hire an R and D cosmetic chemist. So, wow. Yeah. In the amazing. last few months, she is amazing. Yeah. She really she's is great. She's yeah. great. Um, but yeah, well, these products are our brainchild. Are you guys, are you guys scientists? Is that your, is that your? Kind of. So I literally, so I loved science at school. Mm -hmm. I did an A-level in chemistry when I used, when I was doing my GCSE in, you know, double triple science, whatever it was, mm -hmm. my chemistry teacher used to give me like kind of university level work to do because wow. I loved wow. chemistry so much. Okay. So I've always been a bit of a science yeah. nerd. But neither of us. That is also true. But um, what what happened when me and Joyson met is Joyson was had done a lot of research. So um, Joyce Lynn's dissertation was actually on the politics of Afro hair, oh. and we had lots of conversations about hair. And Joyson would zoom it out and take this kind of sociology type approach and say, you know, this industry doesn't make sense. Why does this group of people mm -hmm. run it? why are these needs not met. Okay. And we talked a lot about the research Joyson had done when she had bold patches okay. and looking at materials, uh, you know, ingredients that have been used for generations and generations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, that something's been used for a long time doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean that it's great, mm -hmm. yeah. but it does tell you, you should probably look here. There might be something yes. in it. Mm -hmm. 
So Joyson had done this research and me being, as Joyson said, the nerd that I am, I was like, I want to know why it works. I want to understand the science. Um, I'm that person who would just read encyclopedias for fun and I would <laughs> go down Wikipedia yeah. rabbit holes and just like to know how things work. So we ended up, we went to the library. We used to joke that when you study humanities, you yeah. just get a library card because the contact hours were so low. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we used it. We did research in terms of, you know, Mintel, uh, market research, mm-hmm. but more importantly, we discovered cosmetic science journals and okay. we started reading about the you know chemical composition. We started reading about sebum. We yes. started reading about wow. things like jojoba oil and mm-hmm. how it has a very similar molecular structure yes. to the body's. I can see the geeky part. That's yeah. right. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> right. So, ladies, you've touched on it a little bit already, but tell us a bit more about your lives before uni. What was life like growing up? So I grew up in Hackney on a council estate. Um, we in a two-bedroom flat, um, and I shared a room with my brother and my sister wow. until my sister went to uni at 18. So I was 16, sharing a room with an 11-year-old, and we wow. shared until I went to uni two wow. years later. Yeah. So I never had my own room mm. until 19. Wow. Um, so yeah. My goodness. Um, I remember growing up feeling poor. Yeah. Um, because we were, but my parents never made us feel poor. I just kind of knew we were because September would start, would start new school year and people would have new trainers yeah. and new bags and at Christmas people would get new stuff, but we wouldn't because yeah. my parents couldn't afford it. My dad was a minicab driver. Yeah. Funny enough, he's an Uber driver now. <laughs> um, and he spreads the word to his Uber customers. He really does. Um, and my mum worked in Pound Stretcher, mm. so wow. that's the kind of household I grew up in. So wow. I knew that going to university and getting a good education was my way out of not having to repeat that pattern. Mm. Right. So. Quite similar, uh, except I grew up on the other side of London, so yeah. I grew up in uh, northwest London. Okay. And uh, like Harrow, Stanmore, Kempton, Burnt Oak, we moved a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I'm one of four, I've got two older brothers, younger sister, I've got a half sister as well. Um, Similarly, I shared a room with my sister Mm -hmm. until I left home. Um, And we grew up with probably not not that much, but it was strange. It was like a a tale of two childhoods, (laughs) because my grandparents live in Ghana, Mm -hmm. and I I almost grew up kind of between Accra and London, because they just flew us over so much, and we'd spend so much time there. I think they were a bit concerned, because there was a little bit of kind of, chaos, violence, you know. Um, My dad moved here because there was a big military coup in Ghana, Mm -hmm. um, ruling sort of Fred and Chroma, and he didn't really like my dad, so he was always in prison. Um, So he kind of ran away, and he was born in Croydon, actually. Mm But he didn't grow up here, he grew up in Canada. But for him it was, I've got a British passport, mm-hmm. may as well come here. And my mum followed pregnant with me like a, a month or so before I was born. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of quite unstable. I think my parents needed a lot of therapy that they didn't get. <laughs> so, so then uh, I've had to have a lot of therapy. Yeah. And even though it, it was very chaotic, when we were in Ghana, there were lots of good memories. So I really enjoyed that time. But I missed a lot of school and I was this kind of poor, scabby child that was always bleeding because my ex-mom was so bad. So wow. I don't really love school. <laughs> so I kind Gosh. of, you know, stay at home and read yeah. books when I could. Okay, so I'm really curious about how much, how, how much did it actually cost you to start this business? The reason I'm asking is that lots of people want to start businesses, but the big, almost barrier lots of people have is, I don't have the money to start. Okay. So do you want to just speak to that? Like, what did it cost you guys to actually get started and how did you do it? Yeah. So we each put in fifty pounds, so hundred pounds. But this was in, pounds. but this was two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine. Right. So we met in our first year of university. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's been two thousand and nine. So fifty pounds, I guess, in today's money with inflation, it's a couple hundred pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't like small, small money. It, you know, it was a struggle. Um, <laughs> but we saw it as, um, you know, I had a part-time job. We both yeah. had, you know, our, our student loan bursaries had come mm-hmm. through. I, I had a scholarship as well. So there was like a little bit of money. Mm-hmm. And we thought, worst case scenario, we spend the money now and mm-hmm. we make skin and body products for our whole time at university mm-hmm. and at least we don't have to buy those again it will save us money mm-hmm. and if we can sell some and help other people to solve similar problems mm-hmm. at least we can break even that was the plan 
And then we built this really basic website. We printed off these basic labels, <laughs> sold it at a little trade show. Love it. After doing our research and giving ourselves headaches with different essential oils. And people were really interested. So we were not prepared for how excited people were. You didn't were. see the demand coming? No, no not right. with that. The website. When I say I literally learned to code on MySpace and Neopets. <laughs> The website was not good, right? It looked like yeah. someone who learned to code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was super basic. The colours were weird. There were lots, yeah, lots brown, of brown, and orange. brown and orange. Mm. And um, I think our first logo, I literally designed it on paint. Oh so no! I was, doing, I was doing work experiments <laughs> in um, in Ghana, a law firm. Okay. And I remember the internet went down, and yeah. all I had was paint and solitaire. So I paint, played solitaire for a bit. I, I finished my work. I couldn't do my other work, so yeah, I needed yeah, the yeah. internet. So I opened paint and I designed our first logo. <laughs> Amazing. One thing that really drew a lot of attention to you guys recently is that you raised over a million dollars funding for your business, which is which is completely mind blowing, by the way. The, the stat when you go and look at the research, it's a very tiny percentage of black owned business owners who have raised that sort of money. So, how have you gone, being frank, from life of living in cancer estates, becoming these women who have raised over a million dollars in your business and growing? This is really just the beginning. Has that happened? And you're, and you're Tell the people. Sheer <laughs> determination. Um, well, we, we started our fundraising journey around 2017, right? I remember that first pitch deck. There was loads of blues and greens on it. <laughs> um, and we just... Uh, yeah. One word. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I remember we had... As part of that UCL programme that we won, we had a business mentor. She was a lady mm. with um, Afro hair, relaxed Afro hair. Mm. And she said, you know, if somebody who wasn't black had this business idea, they'll take it way beyond what you ladies are thinking. Mm. And that kind of made us think, actually, this has the ability to go. But we wanted it to be large anyway. It wasn't mm. like, you know, a small business. It yeah. just, just take, took too much time, energy and money mm. for it to be small. Mm -hmm. So then we started the fundraising journey. I had no idea about fundraising. I don't know if you did, Ray, right? if you no, kind of- that stage. I just started learning out and reading all the books. Yeah, venture capital, all of this, yeah. would, would go to different workshops and they'd be like, ways to raise money for your business, uh, equity, mm -hmm. debt, grants, yeah. loans, mm -hmm. all, of, all of that. So we started very basic, we didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. And then we said, okay, we don't know rich people, we're gonna have to network. <laughs> okay, so okay. I remember when Rachel was on maternity leave with her first daughter, Mm -hmm. I would literally go on Eventbrite and type in Pitch Events London and I would go to whichever ones I could. Um, just just to network with people who um, who were in that industry. Yeah. 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 Um, and neither of us like networking. Mm -hmm. Both I'm a huge introvert, Joyce is wow. quite reserved. Yeah. We don't really like talking to strangers. <laughs> so you're, you're pushing yourself. So what we so did is we set targets, right? Mm -hmm. So we'd find events. We, so Joyson did a lot of that, which was great. Mm -hmm. And I think when I was pregnant, we were up for an award at UCL. Yeah, yeah. And we'd talk about, oh, I don't want to go to this event, don't want to go. And we'd go and we'd be like, okay, I'd, I'd speak to two people, we'll get three business cards. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's Joyce wasn't there, I'd text her like, Okay, I've got two business cards. I'm going to get one and then I'll go in there. <laughs> All the dry small talk is too much. <laughs> you know, I don't really like wine. So what else am I oh, doing at networking events? And there's Rachel would apply for different competition events. So we've won a lot of awards. So Sometimes we just <laughs> apply for them because we're like, well, may as well. Yeah, might as may well. well. See. Um, so, yeah. And then we would, would win some of them. Like, I remember the Birmingham one. Do you remember like with tag yeah, team? Yeah. So you'd go up one. It was like over four weeks. So yeah. Rachel would do one Just week. Turns. I'll do week two. She'll do week three wow. because we had to go up and down on the train. And then we won. Yeah, and then we won because a lot of businesses were like boring science ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and no, do you know what? I, it's not even me saying that. Yeah. Someone came up to me after and said your pitch was really good and inspiring. Mm. The other ones. Are yeah. Um, like, yeah, people selling stuff that they wanted to sell to their NHS, like if they got an right. NHS contract, yeah. that, right. that would be their big break. Right. Yeah. Right. And I think it was also partly the storytelling, because whoever would pitch would always talk about okay. the difference it's made to people's lives, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason we wanted it to be big isn't we want to be really rich. Like, mm -hmm. that, that's not the goal. The goal is we want to solve this problem for ourselves, for mm -hmm. our families, mm -hmm. for everyone with Afro and curly hair. Why mm -hmm. should you have to risk your health exactly. to look professional to look attractive it doesn't make any sense so ladies what do you love the most about running your business the team <laughs> that's easy oh. definitely the team uh, yeah i think we have quite a special culture mm -hmm. we summarize our core values 
into an acronym ACE. It's a bit cheesy, but okay. we have cheesy moments. So it's all about authenticity, collaboration, and excellence. Okay. And everyone on the team can hold us that. So, so sure. <laughs> come to the team. ACE. Has it felt weird just having interest, like going from you two mm-hmm. doing your thing as friends to suddenly become like, oh, look, we've got a team, but that's our team meeting. Has that been a weird thing or not? It wasn't sudden. <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it's felt slow. Right. Yeah. But in a way, that's been good because it's built us up to be ready. So we had, we've done a couple of internships before that when we couldn't pay, we did work experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we realised it was bigger than just us and mm-hmm. we had friends volunteer. Random people at uni would message us when they'd hear about press and say, Can I do something? And then we started hiring um, work experience people, then interns. So that kind of helped us to develop our managerial leadership skills. What would you say the top three tools you use to make your business a success? Books. (laughs) Yeah. That's books. Yeah, books. If we don't really know very much about something, we'll find books. This is usually Rachel. Okay. We'll find books um, to read, or you know, I'll, I might see a book and be like, Rachel, you're going to read it faster than me, so <laughs> <laughs> just still it. Yeah. So, number two, taking it back to the tech stack, yeah. um, so practical tool, just the e commerce platform we use. So, okay. I'll see a message Shopify, which we definitely recommend. Okay. And okay. before that, it was WordPress, very much hacked together yeah. um, with a WooCommerce kind of right. plugin. Right. 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 So glitchy, so many bugs, no, no, always crashing. Okay. When I remember when Nadia, just before we hired her, so I think I'd had my daughter in 2016, 2017, Nadia used to come over to my house whilst the baby slept because I was like, I need help. Yeah. She's gone traveling, gone to see the world. And she used to come over and she would do some work or apply for jobs and then she'd help with migrating our website from WordPress to Shopify. Mm-hmm. I think it took us about two or three weeks. Okay. But the day we actually launched the store, our sales tripled overnight. Whoa! Because so many people, mm-hmm. their orders were just not, they were getting stuck in the back end. Oh, no. And then they just give up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So tripled overnight. So with Shopify, what you have is you don't need to worry about the tech. It's very yeah. straightforward. Yeah. Even if you're not a techie person, you can easily find experts mm-hmm. who can work with you. If wow. you are a techie person, you can do quite a lot with it. Yeah. So Shopify is a tool. It's another kind of tech stack one. So Charlie HR, the oh, whole okay. HR system that we use. Mm-hmm. I think you can do that. Yeah, yeah. got us yeah. on the free trial. Yeah. Well, we pay for it now. We pay for it now. <laughs> but it's worth the money. So Charlie HR is a really good kind of technology replace for a HR team when you can't afford to. Oh, yeah. yes. So That's it means everyone one. can process all like their holiday requests and right. kind of sick leave, compassionate leave, everything kind of goes through it. Cool. Yeah. So those are three tools. We're going to put links to all those below yeah. like, for you guys to check them out. So do make sure you yeah, just head over below. And we do have an Afrocentrics library to go with a uh, number one book. So we can uh, also give you a couple of our top titles from there. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you've launched your business, you've been growing for a few years now. What do you do to market and grow your business? Like, do you want to share some tips for some of our, our community here? <laughs> sure. So it's mainly content marketing. We really think a lot about what are the problems that our customers face, mm-hmm. what's the most simple way to solve those problems, mm-hmm. which is usually not simple at all. <laughs> so we go through the complexity, we present it in a kind of simplified format. Okay. So we use things like uh, booklets, ebooks videos, we've started okay. to make reels and TikToks okay. and the platform may change mm-hmm. but our general approach is solve problems first mm-hmm. and if you're always doing that then your content will be shareable, it's more mm-hmm. likely to go viral I love that because it actually resonates with people mm-hmm. and then we yes. do all of the things, you know, our SEO has been on point since about 2018 and that brings in a lot of organic traffic, about 70% of our sales wow. are from organic, organic traffic. traffic. Yep, um, so get your SEO on point. Mm-hmm. And original content, we've seen lots of people just lift things from the website and copy it. Mm-hmm. Google knows, they've yeah. seen where that came from. Okay. Even if you change a few words, it's very yeah. obvious. So yeah. do your own research, write your own content. Yeah. Definitely use um, some paid advertising. Mm-hmm. So we do, um, you know, PPC across Google, Facebook, mm-hmm. Instagram, YouTube. Mm-hmm. Uh, those, those are some of the big things. We also do flyers, mm-hmm. um, you know, branded merchandise. We have stickers, we've nice. got bags, mm-hmm. got all sorts of swag. Um, what did I miss? Events. Mm. Events. Yeah. 
So during the pandemic, we did webinars, um, but before that, we used to do trade shows um, and okay. do our own events in person as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, we just wanted to give our community a chance to meet us in person. Yeah, yeah. That's so, good. Yeah. so guys, tell us something that you know our audience would love to know. What is the actual secret sauce to your, to your success? So something that no one knows. I think a, a big thing that mm. I guess we, we talk about sometimes, but not all the time because it seems to be not that relevant in business circles, mm. would be faith the fact that mm-hmm. you know we're driven by this higher calling yes um when you run your own business you don't have a boss <laughs> so me and joyce and we're accountable to each other yeah. now we have a board but that's very very new mm-hmm. but we've always had this kind of inbuilt accountability of you know god is watching and we want to do our best we want to you know we, we don't want to be saying oh we're christians yeah. and then we have shoddy products right. that yeah. cause people issues yeah. Yeah. we want to actually make sure that we're serving our community and we're honouring God and I think that makes a, a huge difference yeah I think our values drive us we fundamentally yeah. care about people mm-hmm. um, it's not about becoming a millionaire or running a multi-million mm-hmm. pound business uh, they are faster and easier ways to become rich than running a Afro hair product business mm-hmm. uh, we just care we want to change the world and we want to change that the, the scene for people with Afro hair we just believe that there's a lot of work to be done what's most challenging about running this business <laughs> what would you say there's a lot of moving parts to the business yeah there's always something there's mm-hmm. like everything that could possibly go wrong does. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you try and run campaigns and then the supplier doesn't send you something you need and it throws you back two months. It's very okay. frustrating. Right. It's difficult to plan ahead when there's a lot of things that are out of your control. That's yeah. probably challenging, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, hiring failures have been challenging, mm-hmm. um, but we've learned a lot from them and we've uh, made our recruitment process quite watertight so okay. we're not letting people who are not right for the business in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. And then definitely some of the structural inequalities. Mm-hmm. So we became the ninth black female owned business to raise venture capital in the yeah. UK. Mm-hmm. And as much as everyone was congratulating us and celebrating, we're like, this is really sad. Yeah. This, this isn't yeah. a good thing, yeah. especially because we've been going for 11 years. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like, how good do you have to be? You yeah. know? We're looking at, we, we have lots of friends who are white guys who've raised money for businesses. Mm-hmm. The businesses have failed or they've given up on the business and they've done something else and they're able to raise money again. Mm-hmm. And it's very smooth and easy for them. Yeah. And we've won lots of awards where we get a trophy. <laughs> And someone else in the same competition, who's a white man, mm-hmm. gets money and says to us afterwards, why didn't they invest in you? You guys actually won the competition, yeah. you didn't get the cash, it wow. doesn't make sense. So the fact that we, to raise investment, we had to have, you know, tens of thousands of paying customers. Mm-hmm. But most people at seed stage that raise investment, yeah. if they have a hundred customers, yeah. that's great. Yeah, exactly. So we're not talking like 10 times as much. But mm-hmm. Tens of thousands yeah. versus hundreds, you know? Yeah. So tell us, ladies, how are you able to manage such a successful business and also manage your personal life, you know, your family life? How are you able to balance it all? It is difficult to balance, especially as because, you know, all of our friends know what we do. So sometimes it's difficult to switch off because... <laughs> You want to go to a friend's birthday dinner, not have to talk about work. Mm-hmm. Other people just start asking questions because they're just interested yeah. in what yeah. you're doing. Um, I think scheduling helps and, and prioritising things. Mm-hmm. Um, we just have to learn how to say no. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm better at saying no than Rachel is. Um, she, she's learning. Um, the whole way. <laughs> yeah, but just learning how to say no to things. I think uh, a couple of years ago, I used to say yes to everything, and then I think I hit a massive burnout. Um, I didn't know it was called burnout at the time. I was just right. really tired and sick. So, um, yeah. So just learning how to say no. To say no. Mm-hmm. Time optimization is such a big thing. So I regularly audit my calendar. I actually wrote a medium article about time optimization. Oh, I read that. Yeah, I read. I became obsessed. I read maybe like twenty books on time optimization, time management. Um, I really don't like the phrase time management because it's not really something that can be managed. It just passes, right? (laughs) Uh, We have to manage ourselves and we have to optimize our time. Uh, So that makes a huge difference making sure that i'm looking at my calendar regularly i kind of set up these are the slots where i do particular things okay. but then every kind of half term especially now that my daughter's in school every half right. term i revisit and i change it it's great now really great tips we're going to put in the resources rachel's medium articles that you mentioned earlier 
So the final question I've got for you guys is, if you had to do this all again, think back the last 10, 11 years, if you had to do this all again, what would you do differently? Yeah. I'd do it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad you did it. I would do it again, but I would sleep more. I lost a lot of sleep working. Um, I think we wouldn't bootstrap for as long as we did. Because mm. um, okay. we just didn't, we weren't, we didn't know that mm. there are people who are, you know, springboarding their businesses because of investment. We yeah. would have strung along for much longer. So, mm. yeah, just not bootstrapping for, for as long as. We did. Yes, you did. At the same time, I'm kind of glad that we boots, we were bootstrapping whilst we were learning because mm-hmm. it meant we didn't have kind of, you know, outside voices and yeah. opinions. Yeah. Yeah. All of our money came from our customers. Yeah. They were the only stakeholders that we yeah. listened to yeah. and that was good. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Thank you so much, guys. It has been incredible. Amazing. Really enjoyed visiting your office, seeing your team and so on, actually seeing you guys. I'm just super happy, like I said, we were so excited to come and do this interview and just being here, seeing you beautiful ladies and <laughs> just hearing from you, honestly, I, I cannot wait for the audience to watch this because you dropped so much nuggets, yeah. um, a lot that people can learn from and for me, I, I'm definitely copying all of these, <laughs> especially this one, my ladies are trying to go away. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, I'm, okay. I'm getting yeah. the love. Ladies, thank you so, yeah, no, so, you so much. much. Honestly, it's been great. Great to you. Guys, if you really enjoyed this video, we'd love for you to hit this like button because that just encourages other people to watch our videos. Don't forget to share this video with one other person at least who you think will take so much wisdom, so much value from the incredible little bits of wisdom here that we've shared today from Rachel and Joseph. Thanks so much for watching, guys. And as ever, in all things, be thankful and seek joy. Take, take care. care. Right, check this out, people. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.